Amen. Time to give God the praise, the glory, and the honor in this house on this evening. Amen. We're trusting that everyone is doing well. Amen. You have a wonderful day. If not, God is still on the throne. And things can change for you even now. Bless the name of God. We're just thanking God. Amen. That he's been ever faithful. Amen. He's kept us through dangers seen and unseen. And we just come to say thank you, Lord, this evening. Hallelujah. Oh, goodness. Uh oh oh God is stirring something in the house today. How many people came to see God move in the house today? He is here. He is here. Hallelujah. Oh, that's that soul stirring. That's that soul shaking music. I can, you feel it down in your bones. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we thank you for being so awesome. We thank you for being God. We thank you for bringing your people out into the house today, God, to hear a word from you. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this house will be saturated with your presence. I pray that your glory will fall on your people. I pray that the glory of this house will be magnified, Lord. You said you inhabit the praises of your people, and this will be a house of praise. This will be a house of thanksgiving, and this will be a house where the presence of the Lord rules and reigns and moves and has his way. Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, first I want to say thank you for deciding to come to the house of the Lord and those that are watching via streaming. We want to let the kids know that you can be dismissed into the children programming of the evening. There is a word, there is a lesson prepared for you all in the back, and um, we pray that God will meet you as well. Amen. Amen. I want to uh, give honor to um, Pastor Jomo and Pastor Charmaine. I don't take it lightly, the opportunity to stand before God's people. And I pray that tonight I can do justice to the word of God set before us tonight. Uh, let's get started uh, with the vision. And it reads, to equip people with the knowledge of God's word to empower people to seek God's face in daily prayer, to encounter and be filled with the Holy Spirit, to evangelize our community, our county, and our country, to embrace each person in godly love, for God is love, for each one to reach one. Amen. You know, I feel like as we recite the vision, it's really becoming a part of who I am, because I start asking myself, man, am I seeking God's face in daily prayer? Oh, am I going out to reach one? So I, I really am glad we are instituting that. So um, this is my Bible. So if you hold your, your text, your Bible up, and it reads, or um, let's repeat together. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I believe that my life will never be the same after hearing and doing the living Word of God. Do you believe it? Yes, yes. God's Word has a transformative power to it. Amen, amen. Well, first I want to to recap, and then we're going to get in the ground running because this right here, uh, Romans chapter 9, is one of those passages that you got you to gotta sit in and marinate for a little bit. But 
Um, I want to do a bit of a recap. If you've been following along in the series, you saw that in the beginning of Romans, um, Paul says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. And then he goes on to explain how there is none righteous, no, not one. So he shows us that there is none that seeks after God in, in verse, uh, in chapter 3. Then also in chapter 3, we learn that we are justified by faith. He gives us that powerful passage that says the just shall live by faith. Amen. And then as we continue, we learned in Romans chapter 6 that we are joined with Christ in death. And because we are joined with Christ in death, we will raise, we are raised to newness of life and we have victory. So the, the can't help it don't have power over us. God gives us the ability and the power to mortify the deeds of the flesh, to mortify sin and to live a life according to godliness. So I don't have to do what I used to do anymore. In fact, that old man has been crucified with Christ. Amen. Um, then we got into chapter 8. Chapter 8, listen. I mean, I'm kind of a preacher, but Elder Fitz preached <laughs> Romans chapter 8. My goodness. But in Romans chapter 8, we find out that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, so devil, when you try to condemn me, I know because the Bible tells me that there is no condemnation. So I have to tell my mind, I have to tell my heart, I have to tell my spirit that regardless of what I'm feeling, my feelings may lie, but God's word is truth. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that believe. Amen. And as we continue Going down through Romans chapter 8, at the end, he reminds us that we have been secured. The Bible says that neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor anything can separate me from the love of God. And he preached it, I have, I'm not condemned and I'm loved. So it's not that you're holding it against me. You decided also to love me and nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing I can think, nothing I can imagine, no devil in hell can separate me from the love of God. And he also mentioned in Romans chapter 8, verses 28, verses 30, 28 through 30. We're going to read that first. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Many um, uh, many theologians have call this the golden chain, and we're going to walk through it very quickly. Verse 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those he did foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And I just got one question. Are there any called in the house tonight? Because I know from the chain that he foreknew, he called, he justified, and we are glorified. So now we can be assured that um, if God has started it, he will finish. Your God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Amen. Now, Paul has been going. There's this big high that's happening in Romans now. And then he gets to Romans chapter 9, and there is a little bit of a change. Now he's getting back into some doctrinal teaching, and the tone seems to dip a little bit. And here's what I mean. 
in Romans chapter 9, we're talking about election. Okay? We're not talking about what happens in November every, 40 ye- every four years. We're talking about God's choice. So I have a definition of election that I want to share with you. It's by a scholar named J.I. Packard. The definition of election. The biblical doctrine of election is that before creation, God selected out of the human race foreseen as fallen those whom he would redeem, bring to faith, justify, and glorify in and through Jesus Christ. That sounds a whole lot like who he foreknew he also predestined and called and justified and glorified. So this theme or this biblical doctrine of predestination is what we're going to get into tonight. So as we go into Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So Paul starts off with saying that I've got some anguish. I've got some sorrow in my heart. So Paul is traveling. He's this missionary. We saw this travels in Acts. We saw where he went to Corinth, and he went to Thessalonica, and he went to Galatia, and he went to Jerusalem, and so forth. And people, uh, the Jews, are rejecting the gospel. The Jews, God's people, are rejecting the gospel. And Paul is like, ah, I'm doing my best. There's a burden to reach people that look like me. People that talk like me, I have a burden to reach the Jews. And he said, I am so burdened for them that if it was possible, I would rather switch places with them. Is that the heart that we have for the lost? I believe we should have that type of burden, that type of desire to see people saved? Or do we walk past and be like, well, you know, I got mine. I hope they get theirs, right? Too many times we don't see this this, uh, burden that Paul has. And Paul says, I am willing to give up, if I could, my salvation so that they would be saved. Let me ask you this. What are you willing to give up for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to lose a couple likes and follows on social media? Are you willing to lose a little time, a little comfort? I'm going to tell the truth. I remember when I was in college, and I was like, if I submit my life to Christ, he might call me to a mission field. Somewhere where, you know, there ain't air conditioning and internet, right? The essentials, right? So I was like, man, look, please don't call me to, you know, this third world country. Lord Jesus, I won't make it. But then I see the heart of Paul. And I see Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me, you know? So are we willing to go wherever God sends us for the sake of the gospel. And for some, he sends you to Verizon. He sends you to the military. Wherever it is that you work in, he has sent you there because we are called to preach the gospel everywhere we go. But Paul is seeing, I'm preaching the gospel, and some people are not responding. What should I do? So let's go to four, because the Israelites were really kind of set up to win. Uh, Romans 9, 4, these are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. Wait a minute. One of the reasons Paul's like, I don't get it. How is it that the Jews aren't completely receiving the message of the Messiah? They've been giving everything. Paul is like, wait a minute. They've been given the, they've been adopted. Paul, I mean, um, 
When Moses went to Israel, Moses said, Pharaoh, let my people go because they are the firstborn of God. So God has called Israel as his own. They've experienced the adoption and the delivery of God, yet they didn't respond to the gospel. He says they got the glory. When, when they built the tabernacle, the Bible says the glory fell in the tabernacle. The, the Israelites, they would look outside and see a pillar of fire in the camp. This was the glory of God resting upon them. When the temple was built, the Bible says the glory of God filled the temple so that the priests couldn't stand and minister. The Jews had experienced the glory of God. So how is it? that they are adopted of God, they've seen the glory of God, and yet many still refused. Not only that, the Bible says they saw, they got the covenants, right? So there was the Abraham covenant. Hey, you will be blessed. Um, uh, the, the, through you, the world will be blessed. They got the Adamic covenant. I'm sorry, they had the Davidic covenant. Hey, David, a person from your line will always be on the throne. Speaking of how Jesus would be the Messiah, they had that covenant. They had the covenant from Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, a new covenant I'll put on your heart, no longer on tabs of stone. I'll place the spirit inside of you. So how is it they got all that and still rejected? The Bible says they got the worship, the God of the universe. Well, first it says the law. The God of the universe spoke from heaven the law. The Bible says those first tablets God wrote with his finger. So how is it that they have all this evidence? They see all this glory. They have the word of God, and yet they refuse. So before you jump on the Jews... How is it that people will come to church, they see the glory fall, they hear the word of God, they see what God is doing and still refuse? What? So Paul is like, there has to be an explanation. The Bible says that the Jews had the worship and the covenants. So blessed in the city, or the promises, blessed in the city, blessed in the field. I'll protect you. I'll provide all this. God has given to them, yet they refused. And sometimes I wonder, I say, man, you know, I got the same internet on YouTube. I hear preachers and all kind of stuff. I hear all about the goodness of God and all the things that God has promised to his people. How is it that everybody doesn't accept this grace? How is it that everybody isn't on fire for what God says? And Paul's like, how is it that the Jews aren't responding to this magnificent good news? This is the gospel. And yet people are not responding like I would expect them to respond. Paul even says in verse 5, And to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Through the Jews, Jesus came, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, I'm from Fort Myers. I wish, <laughs> I mean, at Fort Myers, we be like, Deion Sanders is from Fort Myers. We be claiming anybody that come from Fort Myers, <laughs> right? These were the Jews and didn't claim Jesus Christ, right? So, how is it that some were accepting Christ while others were rejecting? Does that mean God's promises failed? Verse 6 says, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. By this means, that is, not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So, not 
every physical descendant of Abraham was a spiritual descendant of Abraham. Just because physically they were Jews doesn't mean they had the same faith as Abraham. They weren't the spiritual sons of Abraham. And then I thought about it. I said, you know what? This kind of shows that there are natural children and there are spiritual children. So when I look in Genesis, I see that there are natural creations of God. And then I see there are the adopted children of God. You have humanity, and then you got the children of promise, those that are adopted into the family of God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So Paul is going to explain how is it that with all this goodness and all this grace and mercy and everything they see, why are there some that are receiving and some that are not? So he says, for this is what the promise said, about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. So what does Paul do? I like Paul because Paul goes to a biblical example. Right? He's talking to the Jews. He's like, they know the, New, the Old Testament. Let me use the Old Testament example. He uses the story of Abraham. And a God promised Abraham, from your son, seed, uh, your son, the world will be blessed. Abraham had a son. His oldest son's name was Ishmael. And God, I mean, and Abraham loved Ishmael. The Bible says, and you can go back and read it, the Bible says, in Genesis 21.10, it, Sarah said, hey, that son needs to go. And the Bible says Abraham was grieved that he had to send his own son out because that was my firstborn son. So as Abraham is looking out, there's two children. He sees, Abra, he sees Ishmael and he sees Isaac. But the thing is, God has chosen Isaac. So when I saw that, I said, man. That was his son. He loved his son, but God said, hey, I'm going to take care of Ishmael. They're going to be blessed because they are your son. That's just not the son of promise. So there are some people that experience the blessings of God and the goodness of God just because of common grace, just because it rains on the just as well as the unjust. There are some that experience the, day, the sunshine and the day and smiles and joys, but that doesn't mean everybody was a child of God. Isaac was the child of promise. But some will say, well, come on now. Come on. That was the, that one Sarah's son. That's why God chose, right? Some will say, God chose Isaac because that was Sarah's son. So God, Paul said, you know what? Let me give you another example. Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of the works, but because of him who calls. So this blows up. Now God is making the choice before the kids do anything good or bad. So now we see God is choosing I, um, Jacob before he did anything wrong and before he did anything good, showing that God chooses who he chooses. See, there's this concept of the sovereignty of God, and the sovereignty of God means God can do whatever he wants to do. God says, my world my choice, <laughs> my world, my will. I can do whatever I want to do in this whole world because I am God. Ooh, ooh. That's tough for us, particularly as Americans, but that's tough for us as natural man because I like to think I am the master of my fate. I am in charge of everything I do. I have my choice. God says, hold on. The, world, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So God chooses um, Isaac and 
Jacob. Right? So, Paul is making this point that Jews, you think that it's because of something you did. You think because of your heritage or something that God chose you for salvation. But it's not. I chose you because I chose you. It was my sovereign choice, my sovereign decision. Because some of us want to give ourselves credit. The Bible says we are saved by faith through grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. And some of us will want to boast. Hey, I come to church on Wednesday. I know I'm going to heaven. <laughs> come on. Hey, hey, I'm serving on the usher or the media or whatever. I know I'm going to heaven. God says, listen, I choose who I choose. You're here because I chose you before the foundation of the world. And because of that, the only one that gets the glory for your salvation is me. God is the one who calls. God is the one who directs. He says, she was told, so Rebecca was told, the older will serve the younger. Um, then it says, as it's written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Again, Paul, or Paul goes back to an Old Testament text. This is found in Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. I like Paul because he's like, I'm talking to the Jews. I'm going to go to Genesis and I'm going to go to Malachi. I'm letting you know it's all through here that God is the one that does the, does the choosing. Verse 2 says, I have loved you, said the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau have I hated. God says, so the people are like, how do I know you love us? Jesus said, because when I had a choice between you as a son of Abraham and Jacob as a, and Esau as a son of Abraham, I, uh, son of Isaac, I chose you. God is making the point that Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, meaning I have the right to choose and I choose to love you. Now, what I like is, as it's laying out, who God chooses is not how man chooses. Man chose, chooses the older and not the younger. But God says, I'm going to choose the younger. Man chooses the one that wasn't the trickster. We see from Jacob's life and Esau's life, Jacob was the trickster. God chose not like man chooses. Society chose the others to get the blessing, but God doesn't choose like man chooses. Society says, hey, your brother that finished college is the one that chooses, not you that dropped out. Your, society says, hey, your sister that got all the attention is the one that God would choose, but the one that had the baby outside is not the one God would choose, but God chooses whom he chooses. Society would say, hey, you've been divorced. You're not one God would choose, but God says, I choose whom I choose. You might still be on probation, but God says, I choose who I choose. So when somebody says, how could God love you? How could God choose you with your past and all that you've done? Say, listen, God chose me before the foundation of the world. And if you got a problem with it, you got a problem with him because I'm walking in everything he'd called me to be because God is sovereign and can choose who he wants to choose. So verse 14, they said, Paul is anticipating an objection. He says, well, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Right? Wait, hold on, hold on. God choosing all like this. This sounds unfair. Is there injustice on God's part? What did Paul say? By no means. Oh, no. Oh, God can do what God chooses to do. And if God chooses me, <laughs> then it is what it is. <laughs> Come on. Um, so, is God's choice unfair? Verse 15 says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not 
on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. If you don't like God's choice, God is the one who has mercy on whom he has mercy. You know the people that don't like this? People that ain't messed up. If you messed up, you don't want justice. You want mercy. Because mercy is getting what you don't deserve. And we have a God that says, you know what? I chose you, so I'm going to have mercy on you. Amen. I saved you. I chose you. Remember that chain? He said, I foreknew, I predestined, I called, I justified and glorified. Why? Because on you, I chose to have mercy. Amen. Amen. For <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have to take a water break. I'm preaching on this one. Verse 17. Now watch this. He uses another example. And this time he uses a different example. So he used, he used Moses. He told Moses, hey, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. And now he picks Pharaoh. He says, for the scripture says, for this very purpose, I raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he who has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Whoa, whoa. I like it when God is sovereign on the mercy stuff. <laughs> God's sovereignty on the hardens stuff is a little different. But what I want you to see here, what I want you to see here is the reason God hardened his heart. It says, let's, let's, the reason he hardened his heart, it says, for this very purpose I've raised you up that I may show my power in you. Hey, if Moses had come and when he threw the snake down, Pharaoh said, hey, let him free, let him go. We wouldn't see all the power that God had to deliver his people. So Moses threw the, they say, ah, we had other people. They threw their snakes down. Okay. So now Pharaoh's heart is getting a little harder, right? Let's look at what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 4, 21. And the Lord said to Moses, now watch this. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, See that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so he will not let his people go. Right? So we see God says he's hardened his heart. Now let's look at uh, Exodus 8.32. The Bible says, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. So is God doing the hardening? Or is Pharaoh doing the hardening? The mystery of election is there is God's sovereignty and human choice. God is doing his part and man is doing his part. So as we look at salvation or the hardening, we see that Pharaoh is like, I ain't let my slaves go. He's hardening his heart. And we see that God is also hardening his heart and allowing it to be hard so that at the end, God's glory, God gets the glory. So whether hearts are hardened or hearts are softened, God gets the glory because his justice is seen on both sides. So is this good? Now, um, verse 19 <laughs> what shall we say then? <laughs> Whenever Paul says, what shall we say then? He's like, so somebody might say this though. All right. So what shall we say then? Why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? So is a sinner still held responsible if God is sovereign? If the hardening is God is doing some of it. Is the sin is um is the person still responsible? So here was what here's how Paul answers it. But who are you, O man, 
to answer back to God, will what is molded say to his molder, why have you made me like this? Ooh. He pulled a God card on it. You know, sometimes you ask your mama something, hey, mom, why I got to do this? And she say, because I said so. I ain't got no rebuttal on that one. I just got to go in the room and cry because I can't go outside. Right? So God said, hey, it's not unfair. He says, God chooses or God has the right to do what he wants to do. So I have a little bit of an example. I was trying to put one together. So I got a tablet and I got a phone, right? Got my tablet, got my phone. And <coughs> Apple makes both of the products. Can the tablet be upset that it's not a phone? No. You just have to deal with how the manufacturer did. I can't fight back what God has already established. Not that Apple's God, but you see my point, right? It's stuck in this position, right? It says, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same vessel one vessel of honorable use and another of dishonorable use? What if, and Paul's like, hypothetical, hypothetical, you know, make sure you're reading it, hypothetical. What if desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, he endured with much patient vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? What if those that were prepared for destruction, what if God showed his grace? and showed his glory by the mercy in which he allowed things to happen. God's people were in Egypt for 400 years. God's mercy is shown. So we can't say God doesn't have any mercy. He sowed mercy to Pharaoh and to Egypt for 400 years. But God had already pre-prepared beforehand that he would get the glory. See how God is playing chess? Well, God is being God, deciding and sovereignly ruling this earth. So, the Israelites, <laughs> the Jews, in order to make some known as riches for vessels of mercy that he beforehand prepared for glory. 24. Even us, whom he has called, so now he's coming back to the Jews. Even us for whom he's called, not for the Jew only, but also for the Gentile. As he, as indeed he says in Hosea, listen, let me go to the prophets. I went to the law. I went to the minor prophets. I went to the last chapter in the book. I'm showing you, Paul is making his argument that election is all the way through this. God's sovereignty and he chooses whom he chooses. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. I don't have time to tell the story of Hosea, but crazy. <laughs> Go back and read it. It's a small book. Um, and in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Here is what God is saying. Because I'm God and because I choose whoever I will, hey, Israel, I'm not just choosing Jews. I'm choosing people from all over the world. And the reason this brown brother is happy that he didn't just stay with the Jews because I'm one of the utmost parts of the world. So God says, hey, those who are not my people, oh, I, woo, those who are not my people, I'll call my people. God chose those to be his people that others wouldn't say are his people. 
So when God called me and when God called you and when God calls that young man on the corner and when God calls that young one in the hospital and when God calls that one, he says, those that people would say are not my people, you don't discount them. You don't look down on them because they are still, can be still those that God has chosen. So we've got to tell everybody. We've got to witness to everybody. Our burden should extend to those outside of my family. Paul said, I'm going to Rome, and after I leave here, I'm going to Spain because the whole world needs to know that there is a God who loves them. There is a God of mercy. There is a God of peace. And he says, just like in Hosea, there are those that are not my people that will call my people. <laughs> Then he goes to Isaiah. He said, just so that you are clear, this is a biblical teaching. Isaiah, and so verse 27, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. If God didn't show mercy on whom he shows mercy, then we would be just as guilty as Sodom and Gomorrah. When God, um, Abraham Question, ask God a question. He said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And it was in the context of Sodom and Gomorrah. You've got to know that when God chooses whom he chooses and shows mercy on whom he shows mercy unto, that he is a holy God and he don't make no mistakes. Doesn't make any mistakes. Amen. So, what shall we say then? <laughs> <laughs> um, verse 30, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. But the Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. So in this one chapter, in Romans chapter 9, we see God's perspective, and we see the perspective of man. Here we see God, the first half is talking about God's sovereignty. God sovereignly chooses whom he chooses. And then now we see that uh, they had to receive it by faith. So that's your part. The Bible says, whosoever will, let him come. The Bible says that faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in this study of election, we see God is doing his part, but we also are to receive and respond to the summoning in which God has called us. He says, whom he foreknew, he predestined, and he called. Sometimes we pick up the story at the middle. We say, hey, I was sitting in a sanctuary, and some evangelist or preacher or whoever, they were preaching, and I heard the call. But from God's perspective, before the foundation of the world, I foreknew, I predestined, and we picked you up here at the call, right? So this doctrine of election is a blessing to us because I responded in faith to a process that God already started in eternity past. And the thing about picking it up in the beginning is I know that after the call, there is justified and there's glorified. So realize that whom God calls, he keeps. He keeps. The doctrine of election is one debated topic in theological circles. So you may have to go back and look at it again. But when you understand that God calls you, 
he shows mercy on whom he'll show mercy. And your, he, he gives you the faith to believe. You respond in belief to what God has preordained before the foundation of the world. I hope that makes sense. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it if by works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. The Jews thought that if I'm good enough, the Jews thought if I obeyed all the laws, the Jews thought that if I do everything right and live perfectly and always did my sacrifices on time and always paid 10% of my tithes and I always did everything I was supposed to do without missing a Sunday, that is how I get to heaven. But God says, listen, before the foundation of the world, I knew you and I called you and whom God calls, he keeps as it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rocket of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Trust in God. Believe in him. You will not be put to shame because that chain ends in glorification. Are you blessed by the word today? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible teaches that whosoever will, let him come. The Bible says, in the day that you hear the Lord's voice, harden not your heart. Those that hear God tugging on their heart, today is the day that you are to respond to the calling that God has on your life. If you sense that calling and are ready to respond, then repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I believe he is the life and I receive my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we want to know about it. Go to lfcc.tv forward slash pray and continue listening to this Roman series because this series has talked about how to walk in the spirit. When you receive Christ, you receive that spirit, the spirit of God, and he will show you how to walk and live in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. There are four ways to give. Um, so, there are four ways to give to keep the ministry going, to keep um, this ministry moving and sharing the gospel with the world. So, lfcc.tv forward slash give, text the, or you can text the amount to 84321, uh, cash app is available as well. Make sure you put your member number or your real name in the, uh, in the memo. And mail, or you can mail to the church. Uh, let's pray over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you are the source of our supply. We thank you, God, that there is nothing that passes to us that has not come through your hands. And I pray that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, the uh, couple announcements. This week, this Friday, listen, listen, I get phone calls every day after a deadline closes. Please, please, can you open it up? Listen. <laughs> July 1st. The application for the Newman Scholarship will close. So make sure you get that application in today. We want to make sure we can bless the college students. Next, uh, purity for, or passion for purity. The deadline is August. Um, this is a, uh, there are a couple sessions, and then there is a ceremony at the end where we're teaching our young ladies uh, about purity. So you parents, I encourage you to have your 
um, 12 to 18 year old girls really uh, participate uh, with, with this program. We're excited about it. Vacation Bible School starts this Sunday. So each Sunday in the month of, of yeah, woo, Vacation Bible School. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, Vacation Bible School was a big deal. It was like, what? Um, so Vacation Bible School is happening on Sunday. So it's every Sunday, um, the 9 o'clock, 9.45 and 11.45 services. All right. So before we dismiss, I want to bless the food. Um, let's pray. Dear and Father, we thank you once again for the food that we have this evening. I pray that you bless the hands that prepared it, and I thank you for the resources that allowed it to happen today. Fill your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we are dismissed. First John, First John 4.4, 4, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God bless you, and good night.